All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the second of what promises to be a more interminable than we want it to be series about COVID-19, the global pandemic, the national U.S. scene, what we're learning and what we should be doing about it. Um, due to the weird dynamics of Zoom, people are still pouring into the, um, uh, the holding pen area for the webinar. Uh, so we're going to um, get to a rolling start. My name is Jonathan Zittrin. I teach on many things digital at Harvard University. And I am pleased with um, Dr. Margaret Bordeaux to, uh, uh, and uh, our colleague Urs Gasser to co-chair a, um, uh, a unit at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society on digital pandemic response. And as part of that, we are doing a series of Zoom casts or whatever we're calling these things these days where we talk with colleagues and um, people we'd like to be our colleagues about uh, the dynamics of the pandemic and what's happening, what we know, what we don't know, and what you should know as a random person tuning in on Zoom or watching this after the fact. Um, so uh, we should introduce uh, uh, the rest of our uh, three-person panel here. Uh, Dr. Bordeaux, Margaret, you are coming to us from probably, uh, from a COVID standpoint, the safest possible place. You're in the middle of a national park, is that right? That's right. I'm at Glacier National Park. I'm about 20 miles south of the Canadian border. Um, <laughs> Ready to make a quick escape. <laughs> There is some ambient noise uh, around uh, from the train and from folks riding their, their motorbikes through the park, but uh, it's, it's beautiful here and, um, and yes, hopefully relatively COVID free. Wonderful. And Joe Allen, you teach at Harvard University as well. And like, it's a weird way to put it, but this pandemic could basically be no more up your alley than any other event, right? This is basically the moment you were waiting for. Well, yeah, I wish it wasn't happening. And uh, unfortunately, yeah, this is something uh, we do, exposure and risk assessment and, uh, and healthy buildings. So yeah, it's right in the alley of, uh, of this pandemic, unfortunately. Wonderful. And again, everything has an asterisk, uh, but it's really great to have you here and to have uh, the benefit of your expertise as so many of us are trying to sort out uh, what's going on. And we're um, starting a slight affectation, just curious, um, as we check in right now, um, for both you and for Margaret, what three words, uh, compound words are okay as a single word, you would use to describe roughly the state of play of the pandemic in the United States of America on today, August 18th, 2020? Joe, what, what would your three words be? Um, thoroughly failed leadership. Oh, all right. Three words that work together. Um, and uh, um, capturing a certain level of disappointment. Margaret, what would you say? Right, well, I'll keep my word from last time, which is reckoning uh, on a bunch of different fronts. Um, tragic uh, is the other thing I think we have to include now. Um, and third is chaotic. Uh, I think we're entering a moment of particular chaos uh, as we go into the fall. Uh, with some places having rising, uh, rising caseloads, other places trying to reopen schools and universities uh, and businesses. And it's, you know, it really very little direction, as Joe said, uh, in the way of leadership and then sometimes uh, uh, malignant, uh, malignant leadership. Mm. Uh, and I imagine we'll have a chance to unpack all of those things over the course of our specifics. And what we thought we would do is first get a quick update since our last Zoomcast on the state of testing, which uh, Margaret, you and I talked about with Beth Cameron and KJ Sung. So it'd be great to uh, kind of just get a quick snapshot of that situation. And uh, then to talk about some of the evolving knowledge we have around the dynamics of uh, COVID, particularly uh, how it transmits indoor, outdoor, and under what conditions uh, uh, buildings um, uh, pose particular challenges, indoor spaces, and then get to school reopenings and talk about that, and then get to any questions, um, if we haven't hit them already, from people who are tuned in. Uh, if you're on Zoom, there's a Q&A button you can press uh, to lodge a question. If you're on YouTube, I think you may be SOL. So uh, with that uh, said, um, why don't we um, uh, turn to you, Margaret, and just 
fill us in. Uh, since last time we basically talked, it was a hair on fire moment around the state of testing, in particular the delays in returning so-called molecular PCR testing. From the time you get tested, it gets hauled off to a lab, maybe one of just two corporate labs uh, a lot of the time, Quest and LabCorp, and then can take so long that the point of having gotten tested, especially if you're supposed to self-isolate if you test positive, is kind of lost when it takes so long to get the answer back. Um, so, uh, Argret, how are we doing since we last talked? Well, again, I'm never uh, very cheery on this subject. I, you know, not a lot has changed. I, I, you know, the, the states are scrambling, uh, you know, to try to make alternative arrangements. So Georgia and Montana, where I am right now, actually, um, I actually had to get a COVID test here. Uh, one of my kids spiked a fever, and so I had to go and, and get a COVID test in Montana. They recently announced that they'd switched labs. They were not going to use Quest or LabCorp. Massachusetts is working very hard to, you know, be less dependent on Quest and LabCorp. Uh, but still, it's 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 not good. I don't I don't think we're in a better place, uh, and I think we're just seeing the result of that, which is you know rising caseloads. We still don't have our arms around this. Um, you know, I wish I could be positive, but I, I'm just not. Um, we do see a lot of, you know, announcements about uh, new testing modalities that are coming out and a lot of enthusiasm for what might be able to be accomplished uh, once, once they do. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm all about implementation and I just don't see, uh, I, I, you know, we need, we need the cavalry right now, uh, not uh, in a few months. So, so I, you know, I, I still feel not great about it. I do think there is a lot of movement behind the scenes uh, because of the testing issue to get governors to, um, to work together uh, to uh, make a more coordinated plan. Um, so I do think that that is starting to get some traction and there is some movement. Um, so I, I think that's a silver lining, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, wish I, had, I wish I had better news. Got it. So there might be a rabbit out of a hat at some point, but none, we don't see tips of ears yet, even with some of our colleagues attempting, I think, to help extract the rabbit, talking a lot about um, serological testing, cheap testing that you could do at home as easily as testing your water hardness or something. Exactly. Um, I'm also going to transfer back to, to plug in my phone. So, uh, but yes, I, <laughs> I don't see any, uh, I don't see any uh, rabbits in any hats. I think this is all about hard work. It is about systematic planning. It is about leadership and not counting that there's going to be some miracle cure, some miracle intervention that is going to save us. We are going to have to actually do the work uh, that is required to control this, uh, con to control this outbreak. And we just have to grow up and do it. Got it. All right. Well, while you um, figure out a car charging um, scenario, uh, why don't we <laughs> go to, uh, to you? And I don't know if there's anything you want to add on testing, feel free, but otherwise I'm happy to get right rolling on. Uh, uh, I, had, I had one thing on testing. Um, really, uh, a colleague of mine at the Harvard School of Public Health, Michael Minna and others have been leading a charge for um, trying to pull this rabbit out really around uh, antigen testing, this rapid saliva-based, but at-home testing, different from what the NBA and Yale announced over the weekend, which is still a saliva-based test, but it's also a lab-based test. There, are, there is uh, the technology available for at-home rapid tests, but to Margaret's point, you know, we need it now. Uh, it can be ready, but really it's been a holdup on the FDA's part. So if you're interested in this topic, I would suggest following Michael Minna, who's been writing about it. We put out a video uh, over the weekend on a um, daily quick test. If you hashtag daily quick test, you'll find it. It's got over 100,000 views already. That explains the problem with current PCR testing, what these quick tests can do for us, and really hope people start pushing on the FDA to approve it. It takes a different mentality. It's not a diagnostic test like we expect at the doctor's office. It's a tool to control uh, the pandemic or help control the pandemic. So we, we need a mindset shift here and think about how we think about testing. Um, so anyway, that's, a, that's something that I see is, uh, is uh, on the uptick right now in terms of awareness and a new push for one of these rabbits out of the hat. Got it. And I, you were mentioning FDA. Does that mean that there are other countries where this is commonplace and we're just behind? Or is the world struggling to do these serological quick tests? 
Yeah, they're not serological tests, but yeah, others are starting to, to get on this too. It's a paper-based um, test. And, um, uh, and the thing is, you can have, it's rapid, right? You can get an answer back in 15 minutes. So this is the idea. You can get them, if you mass produce them, you can get them down to real cheap, like on the order of a dollar per test. Uh, and the idea is, well, if you could drop these into a hotspot that's experiencing an outbreak, you're no longer flying blind, right? Even if, yeah. if, if the accuracy isn't perfect, it doesn't matter if it's every day and rapid. Right now, as Margaret said, you know, we wait seven days. That's a, that's a useless test to get a result back after seven yeah. days. It's useless, right? We should just- And sorry, it. this is antigen testing. And the antigen is trying to detect the virus itself. Exactly, exactly. Got it. Um, okay. Uh, let's start talking about um, uh, ventilation as a path towards talking about school reopenings. And for that, it'd just be great to kind of in one place uh, get a sense of indoor versus outdoor. So for example, if you're outside and there's a lot of people around, all those pictures of people on beaches, whether or not you're using a fisheye camera, you're passing people on maybe a, a busy sidewalk, but you're outdoors, uh, that kind of thing. Um, are you, how much viral matter might you be receiving if you're passing people who are transmitting? Yeah, so I, I can jump in there. I mean, the reality is we don't know the dose response for this virus yet. It's one of the things we need to know, but we do know that time spent outdoors is much lower risk. If you look at all the outbreaks of three more people, uh, nearly all of them are related to time spent indoors. It makes sense. We know how this virus is transmitted. Several modes are operating. And so there's been a lot of beach shaming out there. Uh, others in our field have been talking about this a lot, but the reality is, you know, people can still have a, a good time as they can during a pandemic, as long as they're being safe and outdoors is a great time to do it. And in fact, we should be taking advantage of this, the periods where we have this nicer weather to get outside, stay distance because your risk is absolutely lower. One of the key reasons, well, one, you have more space, but two is that you essentially take this ventilation question off the table. Outdoors, we have 100% dilution, really. So your risk is much, much, much lower for any buildup or exposure to any airborne viral particles, even at close distance. I suspect this is a question you're gonna to hate to answer, but this is like classic sort of clueless consumer question uh, I ask on my own behalf, not just a friend. If you had to spend an hour in a public place, where would you rather be, indoors with a mask or outdoors without one? Margaret, I know my answer, what are you, what are you, what's yours? Well, I would do outdoors uh, for sure, but- uh, Still wear a mask, uh, I get it, but yeah. yes. Yeah, no question, I'm with Margaret there. Uh-huh. And uh, how bad is a typical modern indoor space compared to say badly ventilated ones uh, and the outdoors? Well, you know, the reality is um, we've been underventilating our, our indoor spaces uh, for decades. We're, we are in the sick building era, ushered in uh, by our energy uh, crisis in the 1970s, where we started tightening up our building envelopes, choking off the air supply to conserve energy. And so the standard setting body that sets ventilation standards for your home, my home, uh, airplanes, schools, offices, sets a minimum ventilation standard. In fact, by name, it's the standard for acceptable indoor air quality. Ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality. So um, uh, I don't know about you, I don't wanna be in a place with acceptable indoor air quality. You want good, right, or healthy. But that's the problem. We're in this, this era of this acceptable minimums and, the, and set for energy, not human health. Going back to the early 1900s, we used to set ventilation based on infectious disease transmission. And we lost our way. We started tightening up the envelope, driving down ventilation rates. So then you have these conditions where people are spending time indoors. There's not a lot of airflow. Indoor pollutants build up, and that's everything from bioeffluent, chemical exposures, and in this case, uh, airborne viral particles. So, um, you know, we, we're, 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 we're paying the consequences right now for our choices that we've stopped designing uh, buildings for people. And I know we'll talk about schools. I can tell you. Uh, horror stories about uh, the state of U.S. schools and ventilation, which is worse than uh, what I just shared now. And can I ask, how, how much is carbon dioxide, CO2, basically our breath coming out uh, with oxygen going in, a proxy for viral purposes, how dangerous a space is? I have my CO2 meter right here. Yeah. And it looks like my space is at 712. Is that right? Yeah. Yep, 712 parts per million. Yeah, so so for background, right, CO2, majority of indoor CO2 is from human exposure, some contribution from what's coming outside. We use it all the time in my field to, 
to get a sense of the ventilation rate, right? So at some point, CO2 will hit steady state in your room, a level where it's in balance. You can also look at the decay after you leave a room to get a sense of how well, how much it's ventilating. So if you're meeting this minimum standard in most places, you'll be at right about a thousand parts per million. In fact, my, I'm a forensic investigator of sick buildings for a long time. A lot of people in my field will use a thousand as a quick cutoff. You go into a place, is it a thousand? Gives you a quick sense. There's lots of caveats around that, but people use it as a quick rule of thumb. You should be under 800 now, even closer to 600, ideally. And outdoors, so, 400? Yeah, outdoors, 400 and rising because of uh, climate rising quickly. Our next, uh, our other slow roll crisis that's been put on uh, hold for a few months here. But yeah, so it's, it's a useful proxy. You have to be careful about how you use it. But you know, my team, for example, um, we wired up uh, Harvard Business School just had a pilot day, a test day, a mock run to get people back to classrooms. So we wired up an entire classroom with these sensors to get a sense, measuring CO2, to get a sense of the spatial and temporal variability and as a real time check that the school would bring enough outdoor air into that space. Mm -hmm. And is the relationship um, linear or geometric? For instance, if it jumps from 400 to 500, then 500 to 600, uh, is each 100 units of additional parts per million CO2 just sort of a linear progression or is it getting much worse for every jump you might detect? Yeah, it's a great question. And in terms of uh, what we know about, let's say, ventilation, which first, we know that ventilation is associated with Higher ventilation is associated with a lot of positive outcomes. Reduced uh, infectious disease transmission, I'll talk about in a second. Uh, reduced or lower worker absenteeism, fewer sick, missed, uh, missed school days, higher cognitive function performance. For this virus, like I said, we don't know this dose response shape yet. So it's, we can't put a number on it that says, hey, at 800, your absolute risk is X. What we are doing is putting these kind of relative terms on it to say, well, we know, um, for example, let's take a, let's take a school and put a, a ventilation rate on this, okay? Um, we know at about the minimum standard, the target is 15 CFM per person, cubic feet per minute per person. That equates to about two air changes per hour. Now an air change means the entire volume of air in the space you're in changes with fresh outdoor air. So two air changes per hour means every 30 minutes, the full volume is cleared out. So if you target four air changes, five air changes, six air changes, you're getting down to every 10 minutes that air is cleaned out. So you can kind of see the step function in risk relative risk reduction, but we don't quite know. We just know it's better. You know, there's a lot of unknowns still. We just, you know, you want um, to be in an area that is meets that's above these minimum ventilation standards uh, that we know are not set for infectious disease. These higher rates have been associated with lower risk of things like influenza transmission. We just don't have the exact number for SARS-CoV-2. And how much could just for a space that you might be in, but you don't own or control. So you might be a student in a classroom or a patron in a restaurant uh, uh, just visiting. And how much could opening a window make a difference for how safe that space is with respect to the breath of other humans? Yeah, it makes a massive difference. And you mentioned the restaurant. There's a high profile uh, investigation that went around in Guangzhou. This restaurant was recirculating air only, no fresh outdoor. They had an air conditioner nothing wrong with air conditioning unless you're just running it on research mode. So they're constantly recirculating the air and they, looked, they did computational fluid dynamic modeling to show the air was cycling over three tables. A lot of people got sick, even people who were downwind of the infector, the sick person, because you had this kind of uh, confined space and a buildup of, of, uh, of pollutants indoor, including the, the virus. So uh, if you think about ventilation, we can mechanically ventilate like a HVAC system on the roof, right? Uh, but if you open windows, it can lead to dramatic reductions. And we've modeled this, for example, in cars, showing that even cracking the window three inches reduces, significantly reduces uh, anything that's in the air, the viral particles in the air. We've just wrapped up testing at uh, a whole bunch of schools, which I'm supposed to share with my town on, on Friday. Uh, but but the, the, key, the takeaway here is that, uh, you know, it shouldn't be surprising you open up the windows, the air exchange rate goes way up. Right. It's going to depend on pressure differentials, temperature gradients, and things like this. But, you know, you create, you, everybody knows that to their house, right? This is like, you don't need a, a study to show you this. You open up the window, create a cross breeze, you know, it cools off. If it's, you know, if there's cooler air outside, you can kind of feel the air. So you can get these dramatic reductions. So here may be just if only to preclude a patent by just stating it outright. So now there's prior art in the public domain. Um, somebody could build a little device, a gizmo, 
that you put up in the room like a smoke alarm and it's basically a CO2 detector. And if it, uh, taking into account other factors, crests above a certain level says time to open a window or get out. And is, is that potentially a way to outfit indoor spaces so that it's not, is this a safe space or an unsafe space, but say that safety is gonna be a function of a lot of stuff, including how many people are crammed into one particular place and how the wind is blowing that day, that would let people adapt as they go. Is that a crazy idea, or a good idea, a bad idea? It's a great idea, and about, so your million dollar idea, unfortunately, is taken. Uh, these exist, they're out in the world. Um, uh, my, you know, my lab at Harvard, we've built these from scratch. There's a whole bunch of companies that sell lower cost, real-time monitors of air quality. Uh, some of these can connect to the building information system. So in real time, it can, to your point, hey, uh, you know, if CO2 hit a certain level, let's open up the dampers in here. In fact, it's called demand control ventilation. A lot of sophisticated new buildings have that. Demand control means when CO occupancy, a lot of people came into my room right now, if you had demand control ventilation, the ventilation would kick on and bring it in. I really like this as a strategy. You know, my, uh, I had a book called Healthy Buildings came out in April, co-authored by Harvard Business School um, uh, professor John McCumber. And we talk about the need to take the pulse of buildings like medical professionals do, right? It's a signal of some physiological indicator. Well, here we want the pulse of the building. And to do that, you take real-time measurements of CO2, temperature, relative humidity, even airborne particles, VOCs, as a way to sense, you know, buildings are changing every second. When you're in the room, it's changing. Certainly they change over the order of years and decades we can see this but they actually change within a day. And so the only way to really know what's happening is to take the pulse of the building and, and take these real-time measurements so that you can course correct fast, right? If you if say that Harvard Business School example I gave, we had all those people in there. Well, what happened if the ventilation system went down? No one would know it. We might describe, hey, it's getting stuffy in here. It's a little uncomfortable. The temperature's off, right? You can kind of sense it, but you don't know it. And, and especially now at these levels we're talking about, the 800 parts per million, you can't detect CO2. So the only way to know is to be taking these measurements and it can be a real time indicator of your point. Say, hey, we got to do something different. The, the room dynamics are changing. Got it. It does sound like that could either then be ideally the responsibility of whoever runs the building, possibly compelled to do it by some form of regulation or failing that, I guess those monitors can be cheap enough that you could have patrons of a restaurant or students in a school designate one student to bring one or have the teacher have one at the desk and if it goes off, we've got to peel off a few kids or we're, we're going outside. I know it's cold today or something like that. Yeah, you know, we talk about this with uh, commercial uh, building owners who, you know, for years, the paradigm was, I'm a certified industrial hygienist. These are the people that go out, take measurements, right? And in past years, you go out, take an air sample, send it to a lab, the data comes back and it's owned by the company, right? And protected usually. And everything's filtered through the company. Well, now companies are saying, well, you know, employees are coming in with this $100 sensor and they don't need a fancy, you know, test from an industrial hygienist. They just go, hey, it's 12, I just told you a thousand's this limit. Jonathan, you go into your work and they say, it's 1200 in here. And you send that to your facilities person, right? So it's democratized, uh, you know, this healthy buildings idea and people are sharing that data. They are sharing that to say, you know, buildings are getting labeled sick buildings. You actually see this on websites like Glassdoor, right? They don't just talk about their salary, their title, uh, you know, how much money they're getting. People say, this place smells like garbage. The ventilation's poor. I've been measuring it. The air quality's off. And so these kind of labels are getting stuck on buildings now. Uh, and it's because of the democratization. People can finally, you know, make the uh, invisible visible with these cheap sensors. We have uh, two questions. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Margaret. Well, I was going to say, sort of two, two other questions that's fascinating. Um, but I'm sure that just to set the stage for our audience, I mean, one is, um, it, is COVID uh, transmitted through the ventilation system? I think that's one, one thing, you know, given the data that you have right now, is, uh, is COVID uh, able to travel through air ventilation systems and how far can it travel? And then two is, I'm sure a lot of folks are thinking, well, this all sounds good, but you know, we're in Boston and it's cold outside. We have tough winters. Uh, 
you know, how, how do we deal with, uh, you know, the elements in the winter? Uh, opening up windows seems, uh, and I saw the pictures from New York City of all the kids sitting in their, you know, toques and coats uh, and having outdoor school uh, in the winter during the flu pandemic of uh, 1918. Uh, but those two things, uh, what, what's your, I'm sure you get those questions a lot. Yeah, it's a really good question. And interestingly enough, um, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci was with us at the School of Public Health two weeks ago on the forum, and I got to ask a question. I asked him about his position on airborne transmission. Um, so there's some, I think, a little bit, uh, uh, it's worth breaking it down for a second, in that there isn't evidence yet, or and I think it's unlikely, that it gets transmitted through the duct into like an adjacent room where someone can get sick. But there is plenty of evidence that um, the virus can be transmitted airborne within the room. And that's beyond this kind of magical six foot buffer. And so it's worth breaking that down a minute to understand where that came from. And where it comes from is this, and you'll hear organizations like WHO still say this, that, that five micron particles. So first let's back up. When, if I'm sick and I cough or sneeze or just talk, I emit a continuum of different particle sizes, right? Some will settle out quickly due to gravitational forces. Some will float into the near field if we're talking and some will float beyond, right? WHO says, well, at five micron particles, settle out quickly before that six foot buffer. But that really ignores the laws of physics. And many in my field are quite, um, uh, we don't understand where that comes from because the reality is a hundred micron particle is what settles out within three to six feet. A five micron particle will stay aloft for 30 minutes or more. And if you look at even basic airflow in a room, it can travel across the room. We know this from aerosol physics, right? There's no question. So, so the science there tells us um, this can happen. And the reality is you emit a continuum of particle sizes, but very quickly within a second, the large particles in respiratory droplets evaporate. So they might be large in the beginning, but they become what we call droplet nuclei, smaller airborne par particles that can spread airborne. So let's break that down. That's one line of evidence, the, the airborne, the uh, physics of this. Second is we have air sampling. We've now detected the viral RNA in places that can only be reached through airborne transport, like in ducks, right? Not saying it's infectious, but showing that it travels certainly beyond where a patient would be in a hospital. The pushback has been, well, that's not viable. That's just RNA. Well, last week, someone isolated viable virus 16 feet from a patient. Again, showing that not only is it spreading past that six foot magical bar barrier, but uh, it can be viable. Third, we go to uh, case studies. And this is right in my wheelhouse with the examples of the choir practice, uh, the restaurant outbreak. My team has modeled the cruise ship outbreak. And in each of those, we've shown quantitatively through modeling that airborne transmission is occurring. In fact, in the cruise ship example, we estimate that around 35 to 40% of the transmission were aerosols. Uh, beyond that six foot buffer. And last, you have the epidemiology. We have the super spreading events, uh, which certainly suggests like other airborne viruses, traditional airborne uh, viruses that have a higher uh, transmission through airborne. So I think if you look at the totality of evidence there, right, the physics, the air sampling, the quantitative modeling and the epidemiology, it certainly all supports the notion that the transmission is happening beyond six foot. And for me, I've said this going back to the first piece I wrote in early February, it's likely airborne transmission is happening, so we should be prudent and, and put in controls. The scientific community will argue this for decades. We still argue about influenza transmission modes, right? So we're going to argue, we won't be resolved forever, right? It'll be a, a thousand papers on this. But right now we're in the pandemic, the virus points, like I want practical, I want implementation. So bring in a little more fresh outdoor air. And you know what, if we're wrong about airborne transmission and it's like 2%, okay, you brought in more outdoor air. But if we're right and it's 40%, and you're not putting in that control and adding that to mask wearing and hand washing and distancing, well, that's a major problem. And that's where we are right now. And I think all of the evidence, uh, every piece of evidence since February supports it. There has been nothing to refute it. So I think it's really practical and prudent that people take these healthy building control strategies and put it in their arsenal uh, of risk reduction strategies. Kind of a, a nice way of illustrating that maybe the esoteric debate between are they respiratory droplets or aerosols is itself sort of esoteric, not something it's both because of the 1% kind of doctrine you're mentioning, which is like, if there's even a small risk that this could be a significant vector, we should be accounting for it now. And because it sounds like there can be a, 
a shift uh, back and forth even between those categories. So uh, um, maybe that's a way into talking about school openings because so far it's sounding like you can open a bunch of windows, you're in better shape, but a lot of schools, as at least two of our questioners have pointed out, tend to be built possibly because of oil shock with windows that don't open and uh, otherwise poor ventilation. And um, yet you're kind of bullish on opening the schools. You've written positively about that. And uh, it'd be great to understand more about uh, thinking about school reopening in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, bullish, I don't think it's quite right, but, um, you know, it, look, there are two conditions precedent. One, you have to control the spread. And two, you have to make enhancements to your risk reduction strategies within the school. So it's the when and the what, when to open and what has to be done. Um, and so that's where I've been bullish to say, hey, you know, if you do those things, sure, schools should open. But if you look at what's happening, say, in Georgia, where they went back to schools and there were cases, well, look what they did, right? Community spread is outrageously high and well beyond the metrics we propose with others at Harvard on what's acceptable for reopening. So they failed that. And then on the what to do, you see the pictures in there. It's overcrowding, no mask wearing. And I've read their plan. They don't talk about ventilation or filtration. So they failed on both. So it's not really a surprise that we've had cases in schools uh, when they fail to follow those two aspects of what, has, what metrics have to be, have to be met. Um, I am confident if we meet those metrics, right? If, if you have low community spread, then the probability of entry into the school, entering a case is lower. That's obvious. It becomes a, a numbers game. And then if you put these other strategies in place, which we know work in hospitals and elsewhere, including and beyond airborne transmission, right? It's mask wearing, it's, it's de-densification, it's managing flows of people and cues of people. Um, if you do those things, we know we can really drive down risk. So. Uh, you know, it's not quite that I'm saying, hey, everybody, I'm not, I'm not doing the Trump here. Everybody get back to school without giving a plan or a strategy or resources. It says, if you meet these conditions, sure, get back. And if you don't, well, then you should expect cases like we saw in Georgia. Margaret, I know you've been thinking a ton about this too. Well, yeah. I mean, my, my concern, as, as Joe has already mentioned, is, you know, really what is the context in which you're opening schools? And, you know, my, I, I go back to, um, you know, if, if basically your, you know, your community transmission is, is not uh, really controlled. And it's really two things. It's not just how many infections you have in your community. Um, that's certainly part of it, but it's also really understanding how robust your public health uh, measures to end community transmission are. Uh, and, you know, I, I still feel like people kind of treat this like a hurricane. They're like, well, the wind speed has gone down, so it must be safe to go outside. It's like, actually, you know, it's not a hurricane. It's stuff that we actually have to take action on to drive down community transmission rates and, 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 and levels of the virus circulating in the community. And then, uh, you know, take, a, take those actions. And then let's talk about, you know, reopening and taking on more risk, or at least have that context uh, in mind. So I, I, that's where I think there's just a tremendous amount of magical thinking. Uh, where we just think, oh, well, okay, yeah, we, we put some money in public health. Oh, yeah, we, ha we have a contact tracing program. Yeah, and well, we, we've told people to wear those masks, you know, but like, actually, our testing is still very weak. We still are only detecting about 10 to 20, maybe at most 30% of our active cases that are infectious cases in our communities in general. And that's just, you know, so it's just... It, I think it's it leads people to believe that things are are safe and that they're acting responsible when they're when they're not. I mean, and for people. So 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 the other thing that really bothers me. I mean, I'll just to say, is you, you do we do need a national plan. We need a strategy, and 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 that is to to coordinate resources to set standards across states and and communities. You, you know, to have a clear eyed view of how we're even measuring. Uh, community transmission, that, that isn't in place. And so that's where my frustration is, um, is in that, that that we're not having a very intelligent conversation about really what we're dealing with uh, to date. And so that that's not related to schools and whether schools could be made safe. They absolutely can be made safe. We've seen it. We've seen buildings like hospitals, as, as um, 
Dr. Allen has pointed out, you know, we, we, we can make places safe, but, but I think that it's um, asking a lot to say, okay, let's reopen schools when we're not having a smart uh, conversation about where we stand with community, tra community transmission in general. Um, I, I don't think that's that, that controversial, <laughs> but that, that's my, you know, anyway, that, that's my soapbox. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, and that, that absolutely seems to accord between the two of you with uh, the need for a national plan. In the meantime, given that we don't have one, it sounds like what you're each saying is there are conditions in time or somewhere within the U.S. Uh, where I guess transmission rates appear to be at their lowest, where maybe it would be okay to hazard a reopening, ready to spring the trap shut again if we see community transmission going up? Is that the basic idea? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's, that's right. I think the, um, the uh, you know, in some senses, the K through 12 public school reopenings are, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think we are in a better place to consider that than we are universities because there's something called interstate transit where people come to universities from other states with uh, you know bringing with them the uh, uh, potentially the, the 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 virus and so you know we are I, I guess I I feel a little bit like a worm on a hook where you know we are trying to cope with uncopable things <laughs> and conditions uh, instead of trying to turn around and, 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 and face them and fight them, fight for them. Uh, we need to fight for a national plan. Uh, we need to fight for a co or at least a cross state plan uh, where we get our governors to agree on standards uh, and approaches and share resources <laughs> intelligently. Um, and, and so I, I think that my, my point is, is not um, my point is is that let's 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 embrace that challenge uh, in addition to trying to make do but I don't want to just continue to just say okay well we just have to make do we live in a democracy we live in a country that we govern ourselves so we can you know put pressure on our leadership to uh, to, to do better and to and to work together so I just want to let people off the hook of that particular challenge as we pivot to talking about things like school reopening. And uh, how much should part of the formula be whatever insights the community is coming to, the scientific community, the medical community, about the dynamics of this particular illness among kids? Because we've heard a lot of different things about it. All else equal and with your interstate travel uh, piece out of the equation, let's not, let's just say K through 12 or pre-K through 12, is it a different thing with a daycare center versus a third grade versus a seventh grade uh, because of anything we know about how susceptible um, people at different ages are to the virus? This is interesting because uh, Dr. Allen and I might have weigh this a little differently. You know, I'm, I'm a pediatrician by training and it, um, I think this has really been a struggle for me personally. Uh, you know, where I'm like, we're dealing with a virus where yes, the evidence in general shows that, you know, children either do not, certainly don't seem to be getting as sick from it uh, and, uh, and don't seem to transmit it um, as readily. But I, I really have to say, I, there's some things that really give me pause. Uh, really, we, this is a new virus. We really don't understand the long-term sequelae. Um, I am worried about, you know, being overly reassuring uh, in this regard when I don't really understand the risk. Now, that being said, I think, uh, you know, the risk of keeping kids out of school is tremendous and that's a known, a known risk. Uh, so I, I've had, I've really struggled to balance known risk, which is significant against unknown risk that might be from you know very low risk to a very very significant risk. Uh, Dr. Allen, how how have you how have you felt about that? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? So um, you know you're you're right in it. You're a pediatrician dealing with the kids. I, I'm, my background's exposure and risk, but public health, so it's population statistics, right? So um, you know I, I think about this virus is not spared us in many ways, but but in a lot of ways with kids it has. And there were to me really three additional important questions and thinking about, you know, this reopening questions around schools. And by the way, I just want to say quickly that the plans we put in place, my team put out also is intended to protect adults. So I'm not minimizing uh, teacher and administrator risk, but just talking about kids for now for a second. 
Um, they're less likely to catch this than adults. I think that's pretty robust at this point, right? It becomes a, 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 a joint probabilities uh, question here because then if they get it, they're less likely to suffer the most severe consequences. A really large seroprevalence study uh, just, just came out out of Europe, 358,000 cases in kids, 11 deaths. So the infection fatality rate is on the order of three in 100,000. So uh, of course it can happen. Uh, fortunately, it's rare, um, but the infection fatality rate risk is, is, is quite low for kids, really. Uh, not not uh, the, law, the unknown uh, potential long-term effects, notwithstanding, of course, the impacts of minor infection, relatively minor infection, but on the fatality question, uh, they're spared there largely relative to adults. And there are step functions at certain age groups in that risk. The third is the transmissibility question. And it also, uh, my read of the, the full body of evidence looks like kids transmit less than adults. Certainly the zero to nine year olds do. In that one big study out of South Korea, it's about two to three times less. A lot of people are jumping on that, the, that South Korea study that showed there was a headline, a big headline in the New York Times, unfortunately, that said 10 and 19 year olds transmit the same or more than adults. Well, a lot of us flagged that when it came out. If you look at the data, there wasn't something quite right in that age group. They, looked, they didn't look like their immediately younger age group or the immediately older age group. They looked like 70 year olds. It didn't make sense. A lot of us were concerned about the methodology there, about identifying who was the index patient and when. And it turns out just last week, that study was largely corrected. Uh, it was an erroneous uh, finding. It was an erroneous headline a couple of weeks ago. But that headline hit millions of people, right? You'll see everybody says, well, 10 and 19 year olds, they spread the same as adults. And the correction, you know, you know, maybe got like a dozen likes on Twitter or something like this. So, um, but anyway, on those three big questions, right? They get it less, uh, less likely to die from it, really robust. Looks like they transmit it less. And against what Margaret said, right? These massive costs of keeping kids out of school. It's a story that's not being told right now. We hear stories of cases right and importantly we do but you know there was a stat recently 17 million kids don't have access to high-speed internet uh 10 000 kids in boston in may were virtual dropouts only half the kids in philadelphia in may checked in in elementary school checked in each day i've had emails from teachers saying look in june i haven't heard from my students since march i don't even know if they're okay i'm worried if we don't go back what's going to happen with them so the stories right now over the next couple of weeks will be cases in schools right headline news but next year's public health headlines are going to be horrific. Uh, we, if we don't think there are consequences to keeping tens of millions of kids outside of school, uh, they're at higher risk of abuse, neglect, exploitation, the loss of learning, the loss of socialization. Uh, over 30 million kids rely on schools for meals. I mean, these are massive, massive, massive costs. Uh, and it just it's, it's horrifying uh, uh, to recognize that our country hasn't prioritized this and getting kids back, knowing that these, these consequences are so severe, and yet we're we're screwing around on the edges here, honestly, with reopening bars and restaurants and, the, and not doing the thing that is our first and number one priority, which should be getting kids back to school and keeping communities spread low. So anyway, that's a lot of uh, a monologue there, but really I think it's, it's important to think about risk, not just in the classroom, but this bigger conversation of risk uh, and put it in context. And uh, you know, we're not seeing those stories. It, it's a missing story because these kids are missing. Maybe I can ask something to tie together um a lot of what we were just talking about with your mention of the study that then turned out to be retracted that uh, is, um, is no doubt well known to people in public health, trying to communicate a message that people can easily grasp and hear while they're dealing with yapping kids and juggling their groceries and everything is very different from capturing every last subtlety and difference. And I wonder if that translates to public policy as well, that trying to have too many different factors about when you can reopen and then you have to shut again and what data you'd measure to know when you were in one zone or another, um, that how much should the policy guidelines be rather crude, even at the risk of missing some of the distinctions that you've both been so nicely talking about, particularly when, if I'm just projecting out a little bit, it sounds like if we were to be more discerning, it would probably mean that communities that have the budgets and the buildings to already be healthy or make them healthier, then thanks to the subtlety, they start going back to school, but communities that have worse physical infrastructure, um, less of a prospect of ameliorating it, and more community transmission, because we know this is hitting poorer, marginalized, black and brown communities significantly more uh, than the baseline 
does that mean we would basically end up with a tiered system where thanks to the very subtlety that we're trying to capture and when it's okay to reopen, you end up with communities where everything feels fine and then you have communities left behind still stuck kind of online because we didn't have the rising tide try to, to lift all of the boats. Yeah, it's a really good point. This equity question, like we've seen already, uh, this virus is exposing uh, these deep fissures within our society, the structural racism that's in our society that exists within these schools. Unfortunately, I don't think it's as, um, you know, if we keep kids all home, that's going to exist for the exact same reason, right? And, and if, if you bring back some, well, that inequality uh, and equity is going to exist and, and be exacerbated as well. And so it's like, it's, it's, there's no um, simple answer here other than honestly, it's a systemic issue that needs to be fixed and fixed fast. And we haven't put forward the resources. Think about what we've done for uh, stimulus right here, right? Where has the, the real stimulus been for schools? And I mean, st I don't mean starting, you know, August 18th. We should have been working on this in March when these schools close. How are we gonna get these kids back? What resources do we need to fix our schools? 90% of schools don't even meet that minimum ventilation we were, we were talking about in the beginning. 90% of US schools don't even meet the minimum. They're actually about half. And so we failed, we have failed, as, as Margaret said, for this national response. The resources aren't there, the, the, the seriousness is not there. Uh, and that's the way, honestly, right, because different communities can have, some people can lock it up, say, oh, my kid's gonna learn from home, that's great. Well, I bet you have resources, I bet you have money, maybe two parents, in the house working, you have high speed internet, maybe you have two computers and an iPad. Okay, well, that's not the reality for, for the vast majority of the country. And so this has to be fixed. Margaret mentioned this nicely. This has to be fixed with, at a national level. This ad hoc approach, every community doing something different is not working. In fact, everyone's kind of, uh, you know, fighting and pulling, pulling with, without some centralized messaging. And the message is totally lost and confused because, you know, it shouldn't be a small Harvard program on healthy buildings putting out guidance for schools. This should be done by the CDC. And where is that, you know, national guidance that, and leadership? It's just been so absent since March. Uh, and, and it's exacerbating these structural issues in our society, like everything else this, uh, this virus has exposed. This seems like a key message that should come in stereo. So, Margaret? <laughs> oh, God. You know, I can barely talk about it. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you really step back and take the full measure of what's happening here, it's just, it's a horror movie. It, I mean, it, it's just a horror movie. It, it's it's watching everybody stampede for the exits and trample on each other. You know, I'm a big fan of zombie movies because uh, the theme of zombie movies is always, you know, it's not the zombies that are scary. It's what we're willing to do to each other. That's the horror of the of the zombie movie, and that's very much how I feel about this. Um, so uh, yeah, so so you know, to your point, I think you know, basically it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, kind of situation, whereas schools, uh, kids that are most in need of school, who are most uh, going to suffer tremendous consequences if they can't go to school, are also being, uh, you, you know, their option for school is is the least healthy option and the one that's exposing them the most. And of course, they are likely to be children of parents who are, you know, not so much essential workers as they are disposable workers. Uh, people who cannot stay at home uh, to work, that uh, don't have uh, health insurance, that don't have work protections, uh, that are being forced into uh, job uh, scenarios where they are having to uh, interact with lots of people in dangerous situations. So it, it really is, uh, I mean, I don't even know the word frankly, um, horrifying, but, uh, but let's, you know, but that's where we're at. So let's get real here and start to think about, I think that the, the, the way that I would say it is when I got into public health, I have to admit, I'll just say this is my own bias. I kind of thought about like, okay, you know, you're going to do the intervention that's going to help 80% of folks. And okay, then you'll work to try to address the 20% that you leave out. That was sort of the, and that's true of medicine too. You're like, okay, let's think of the intervention that's going to help the most, kind of a utilitarian approach. But really what we have to do is the opposite. We have to start on the margins. We have to uh, focus our, throw our weight 
towards the margins, because that's where, uh, towards the people who are the most vulnerable, the most exposed, that's where our resources should be going. Because as they become uh, more protected, uh, safer, healthier, that's going to actually have the knock-on result of helping the 80%. So anyway, that's been my sort of own sort of realization or journey about how I've started to to flip this um, because I think there's just a lot of it's like kind of shrugging oh of course you know poor people are going to suffer more that's we shouldn't we shouldn't tolerate that as our starting position we need to, to flip that mm -hmm. so uh, given the absence of national leadership here and the kind of chaotic scramble um, that's happening right now the kind of the really scary part of the zombie movie, as it were. Um, are there best practices that are emerging that would be able to leap from one school superintendent to another, even across jurisdictional boundaries, one public health authority to another, or even one parent to another trying to make a decision in the interests of their child about whether to send them to daycare or to elementary school or even back off to university. Um, have there been ways in which we've seen islands in which this is being done right that we can try to light a taper from that and spread given the absence of national leadership and understanding this is a distant second or third best, but are there, are there things we're learning that are simple and concrete enough that could be captured as best practices? Yeah, I think that answer is definitely yes. I have to say through all of this, the one bright spot um, has been, I think the scientific and medical communities, um, you know, for the first time in history, the whole world, uh, every scientist and medical profession is focused on the same problem and breakthroughs are happening really. And they might be not on the headline news all the time, but, uh, but I'll give you one example for schools, right? So we, we put out a guidance report and then we paired up with other scientists at Harvard and beyond. So, you know, it's like this, this machine, a scientific machine that's percolating just under the radar and social channels. People I've never collaborated with. Hey, I like that report. This is my field. Can we take your report, make a checklist? I'm going to get it out to every superintendent. And that's what we did with our Ariadne Labs, which is a tool Gawande's uh, group or a soft written runs it now. Um, but that was that was like a collaboration. They were really good at talking to superintendents. I didn't have that connection. They liked our report. They took it, right? And so these kind of things are happening. Um, and that's one of like a million stories. I have all these new collaborators I've never worked with over the past couple of months because people are just saying like problem solving. Hey, you have this, I have this, let's get together. Let's get a message out. We did this uh, last weekend, um, colleagues of, uh, you know, new colleagues of mine out of Portland said, we want to put together uh, you know, uh, references for, for, for parents. I said, great, we made a website, 20 questions every parent should ask before sending their kids back to school. Questions you should ask, little blurb on what you should expect for the answers. Things like this are really happening, spreading through social media. Um, the unfortunate thing is, right, it's maybe we're hitting some fraction of the population. I'm sure there are other people doing the same thing. It's just not cohesive, so the message isn't tied everywhere. But um, it's certainly happening, um, and, but this is, you know, it's totally, it's ad hoc, <laughs> really, uh, which has its own problems. But but uh, messages getting out on, to your point about what do we know about how it's spread? Uh, and then also about these control um, strategies and tips that people can use. And we, you know, we built a, a, an online tool for people to help select portable air cleaners um, uh, for schools, right? These can be really practical, but how do you do it? So we built this little Excel tool, another set of professors built another tool on how to assess risk indoors. They're, they're like Google Sheets, right? But people can plug and play them. And I think they hope they're really helpful to people. So, that's what's percolating. It just hasn't bubbled up to some cohesive kind of, any kind of national um, uh, strategy, really. It's all ad hoc. Yeah, and I would, I mean, you can take it as a positive thing or a negative thing, but the, but the fact is that, you know, if you look at basically any, any state or even any community where the infection is, was it rising, you know, you, you, you see people individually, collectively trying to take actions. And I, I'm very amused, you know, that uh, through one of the funny things I feel like has been a commentary throughout this entire process is this naysaying about Americans. They're like, well, Americans will never shut down. Americans will never, you know, wear masks. Americans will not, blah, blah, blah. And actually every single time you've told Americans, do it, they, they, this may help you, 
by and large, they have. I mean, we have 75% of Americans saying that, that we want a national mask mandate. I mean, this idea that we can't. So I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think there's tremendous energy and people are working to try to figure out what to do and, you know, how to be helpful and how to open their schools, how to support their communities. I, that, that cannot be denied. And that, that, that is definitely happening. I, I, I do want to say, you know, usually in these situations, however, whenever you have a DIY public health response, <laughs> you know, the, there are, you know, the, the losers there are usually the most marginalized and vulnerable and that, that just is a tragedy and, um, and, and is, we shouldn't tolerate that. Um, but, uh, but I, but I agree, there is, there is a lot of, a lot of effort, uh, and people have with a lot of great ideas. Um, so, so that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I can't help but be trying to grasp for the practical, even acknowledging the implausibility of, um, a sudden transformation of, uh, of national leadership in the near term. And I just wonder, is there a category of idea that's, um, doable while still quite big and probably politically only doable if others are seen doing. And an example would be a kind of standard outfit for an outdoor heated tent in which, you know, put it in the baseball diamond of the school or the football field or the parking lot. And that becomes a year round place in which to do classes or a way of staggering groups, things that are not just let's punch a hole through the wall and ventilate our classroom and otherwise do it as we're normally doing it. Uh, are, is there work being done on things like that that really would require a certain commitment, but that don't seem like having to plant a flag on the moon? Yeah, you know, uh, I like that question. And this motivated a piece uh, we wrote in the Washington Post at the end of July, wrote with another professor, which was, look, we're, tight, we're, we're short on time and resources. To your point, what can schools do, right? We're not going to put new mechanical systems on the roof. I've heard some people saying every duct should have UV lights in it. You know, that's not going to happen in the next two weeks here. So we talk about the strategies that can really reduce risk. And you know, we use uh, this school smart um, uh, with smart as an acronym for S is, uh, stay home when sick, right? That eliminates some fraction. That's obvious, right? If we have asymptomatics, you have to do everything else. M is mask up. Everyone should be masking by now. A is where I think it gets interesting, an air cleaner in every classroom. So I talked to all the air cleaner manufacturers to figure out what their capacity would be. If we had a stimulus, right, a billion dollars, we could put one of these in every classroom. What can a portable air cleaner do with a HEPA filter? Well, we were talking about earlier in this podcast about air changes per hour. Well, member schools might have two, one air change per hour. You want to get up to five or six air changes. You can have a portable air cleaner in a room you're in to give you four to five additional air changes per hour. So for a couple hundred bucks, you're essentially giving that, that's a solution, right? Plug and play, plug it in, HEPA filter sits in the middle of the room. These are, that's an important strategy that I think could be done to your point, like what's now? It's not that technologically savvy. It doesn't have to be. It can be equitable, right? Ship these things all over the place. The manufacturers are on board. We're, we're, we're providing stimulus for vaccine makers. And let's get the manufacturers, these portable air cleaners, to put one in every classroom. Is that, I, don't, I think that's doable. That could be done in the next couple of weeks. Four is our refresh indoor air. We're talking about ventilation. And T, to your point, it's temporary classrooms. Let's put some tents. Let's use the ball field. Let's get creative. Look what the medical community did. The Javits Convention Center and, and in Boston, they were turned into hospitals. There were tents in Central Park. We should turn convention centers into schools. Let's put tents in every park. I mean, we can get real creative here instead of saying, well, we have this old crumbling infrastructure. What are we going to do? Let's just jam a thousand kids back into it and do everything the same way. Instead, I think there are some creative solutions out there to your point. We're running real short on time here, um, but there are things that can be done. And we know these reduce risk. We, we know it, right? Masks and, and ventilation, air quality, hand washing. That's really all they're doing, not all they're doing in hospitals, but really, and they're doing it really well, uh, but they don't physical distance, high risk environment. We know these things can work. Gosh, instead of a chicken in every pot, it's a HEPA cleaner in every classroom. It doesn't have the same ring to it. <laughs> it does to me, it does to me. Yeah, it does <laughs> to me. <laughs> My field. <laughs> So we're cresting the top of the hour. I think uh, it would be great after we sort of formally adjourn, um, any of the participants who wanna uh, stick along, feel free. We'll just quickly uh, kind of rifle through the remaining questions as kind of the deleted scenes. But um, uh, to bring us in for a landing, it'd be great if each of you 
could give us what you figure the headlines are going to be six or nine months from now. Uh, and maybe to make it not too bleak if I'm anticipating where you would go, uh, feel free both to share the headlines that you plausibly would like to see if things could come together. And what are the, but, but start with what's the likely headline? What, what, what's going to be nine months from now, what would normally be maybe looking towards the end of a school year in May or June or something? Um, what do you expect to be uh, uh, top of mind, front page uh, kind of stuff with respect to the pandemic? I don't know, uh, Margaret, you wanna go first? Sure, and I'll try to be more, more positive. Um, yeah, uh, I, let's see. Well, my hope is that the headline would be something like, uh, governors rise to the challenge, uh, ensure you know, struggling school districts have resources to keep their students safe, uh, you know, the uh, school year ends with, um, you know, despite fears, uh, that it ends a lot better on a lot better note than we thought. And we are now bridging into a national plan that is coming together uh, with the, you know, next administration, whatever it may be. And filter media company producers stock <laughs> its all time high. It pays out massive dividends. Yes. Uh, okay, and uh, Joe, but feel free also not just to give the desired headline, but the plausible one. I'd love a crystal ball gaze. Yeah, I, I, I'll be plausible, and, and I actually am optimistic. I'll, I'm not going to lie. So I, I think the headline for next spring will be the Biden-Harris administration uh, starts to um, follow the science again. We elevate scientists and put in a cohesive national strategy, elevate CDC again, start following uh, recommendations. Uh, we get our testing strategy in order. We, we should have been doing this in January and we failed. Um, so I'm hopeful there. And I, I think, you know, I had a, a piece in, in the Washington Post in, uh, in July about six signs for optimism, talking about things that I think are, will come. I think therapeutics uh, are looking pretty good. I think, you know, everyone's waiting for the vaccine at the end, but therapeutics, uh, hopefully uh, we have some already for the most severely ill, but other therapeutics for those even with minor, relatively minor infection. Uh, I think that looks good. I, I hopefully we have um, we have some a new a new set of tools for the doctors of the world to treat people with ahead of the vaccine. So I'm hopeful there. I'm hopeful for these rapid antigen at home tests that say, hey, you're looking to get back to work. Well, pop your uh, you know 15 minute daily quick test and let us know that you're most likely clear. And as a way to tamp down you know explosive super spreader events. So I think those are all doable. I think uh, they have been doable since January. Look, we've known there was a plan to save lives and livelihoods right from the beginning. We knew since March, other countries did it. So it's not like this is uh, rocket science at this point, what needs to be done. It's to Margaret said it earlier, it's about hard work. It's about doing the real work, everyone doing their own responsibility uh, in terms of our own personal behavior change, but also relying on a, a, hopefully a government um, uh, to do their part and put in this, this plan to get uh, to put us in the path towards a, the happier spring where kids are actually back in school. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, I'll be thrilled if I'm back on the baseball field with my kids uh, next spring. That'll be, a, that'll be a home run. Then I'm taking all next summer off too, by the way. <laughs> exactly. We're all going on a cruise, right? <laughs> well, that's the sequel to the horror movie, Margaret. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, okay. Uh, this side. Uh, this episode of our Zoomcast sponsored by Princess Cruise Lines. Um, but uh, <laughs> Joe, uh, Margaret, I, I, I know I'm thanking you, even as you're, you're co-hosting, Margaret, but thank you both so much for, to use a, a perhaps fittingly airborne metaphor, dissipating some of the fog around these topics. Um, really grateful for it. Looking forward to checking in again as we go and we can compare against our predictions. And uh, we'll try to see if there's other links we want to paste into the conference room uh, that refer to some of the stuff. I'll get Michael Minna's uh, Twitter account uh, posted there too, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, to our participants, thank you for sticking along with us. We will now um, just like pause a moment for station identification, and then I'd love to just run through some of these Q and A's of people who put them in while we were talking, if that's all right. And that'll just kind of be uh, a little extra uh, bonus at the risk of losing uh, uh, some cohesion. So. Okay, let's go right to it. Uh, it almost seems like a, uh, you know, I don't know who wants to hit the buzzer for each one, but uh, Ryan Budish asks, looking ahead to a post-COVID-19 world, fingers crossed, is any of this work on rapid testing, vaccines, et cetera, gonna be useful for any other diseases, virus or other medical 
issues. Are we going to cure the common cold out of this after all? That's my own spin on his question. Well, go ahead, Margaret. Oh, I, no, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> no. uh, but I, I think that there are some actually, well, I, I think there will certainly be um, real advances in how we understand this class of virus. Uh, and I also think uh, I, I, I am optimistic I, that we are going to come out of this with a renewed, uh, with a new and uh, revised and rebuilt public health system in this country, and a um, and I and a new health care delivery um, way of delivering health care in general. So I, I think there's all sorts of great benefits that are going to come out. And yes, I do think we are going to have some advances in uh, therapy, uh, you know, in therapies and countermeasures against uh, coronaviruses in general. Got it. Couple of questions about uh, uh, transmission. Um, have there been any known transmissions outdoors? Um, there have, yeah, really limited, um, but the vast, vast majority are uh, confirmed to be indoors, especially when it's multiple. But yeah, but there have been a, a small, small fraction, sure. Uh, but just interesting to see, you know, in this also era of protests and such, the number of people sort of mingling together like that, sometimes with masks, sometimes not, uh, quite something. Um, and if it's 40% airborne transmission, what's the other 60% surface contacts or does airborne transmission just mean beyond six feet? What... Yeah, so really good question. And, and so a caveat, that's our modeling based off the cruise ship, which is like an ideal experiment, right? You know, the infector, you know, the time course, who got sick when, where they were in the ship. So like, and what we're doing is taking that and, and using that model to build a tool that anybody can use in any indoor environment. You plug and play your dimensions of your space and estimate risk. So that'll come out in the next uh, week or two. Our team is finishing this web-based model. Um, but I want to be—I caveat there. That's our estimate. Others have estimated different numbers. It, you know, we don't know, like I said, we're going to talk about this for decades, what that number is. But we know that other modes of transmission are operating. You know, close contact, large droplet uh, transmission is happening. Uh, there's some contribution from fomite or contaminated surfaces. It looks like it's less playing a, a less big role. In terms of that aerosol piece, really interesting. What's happening is that um, you know distance still matters. So you can imagine, you know, if Margaret and I are talking face to face, and even if the large droplets settle out quickly, you know, she's going to get a bigger dose of aerosols at three feet than six feet versus twelve feet. So distance still matters, right? It's not like you know, there'll be fewer particles at the other end of this room than there will be close to me. Imagine like if I'm smoking a cigarette at three feet, it's gonna be really noxious, six feet, noxious, but at the back of the room, you'll smell it unless there's great ventilation. Maybe you won't even smell it. So I think that's a useful way to think about it. You still want to uh, distance and all modes of transmission are operating. I'm not saying, you know, open up the windows and forget about hand washing or, you know, absolutely wear a mask too, yeah. And uh, there's not just distance, there's time, I suppose. If you had a perfectly sealed room with a big cloud of virus in it of all the various sizes and distributions, if you just wait for a while, does it sort of disintegrate on its own? Yes, I have bad news there. Uh, the, the, these particles will stay aloft indefinitely. In fact, they're, they're gonna be removed in one of four ways, really. Eventually they'll impact out on the walls. Uh, that's a small contribution. They'll be diluted through ventilation. They'll be cleaned out of the air through filtration or they deposit in the lungs. And, you know, and of course we're trying to avoid that last one, but I, and I mentioned it, but this isn't a minor thing. When you do indoor air quality modeling, you have to account for loss in the lungs. If you model risk in a school classroom, you have to say, well, a certain number of these particles are being breathed in. And so those are the removal. I mean, these, these small particles, they just, they just stay aloft, right? These aren't like orphaned puppies that if they can't find a lung to adopt them within a certain period of time, they waste away. Yeah, I mean, look, the, I mean, over a certain amount of time, right, the virus can be a little less active, but really it's not, you know, if you're staying in a room and I'm, I'm coughing in this room and I'm infectious and releasing this viral load, it's going to increase, increase, increase until those, one of those cleaning mechanisms happen, removal mechanisms, dilution, air cleaning through filtration, or it's going to get absorbed in the lungs. Uh, and that's, that's the reality, you know, over days. Yeah, that's different, right? And of course, you know, buildings breathe, even if, you know, nothing's a perfectly sealed box. You close your windows, buildings are still breathing, right? Even a home, a typical home has half an air change per hour. You think, well, my windows are all closed. Yeah, your, your building's still breathing through little cracks and crevices. So there's always some dilution happening. No, nobody's in a, per, per, fortunately, no one's in a perfectly sealed box. You'd have other problems. Uh, and uh, 
that raises a question about filtration. At least a couple people have asked about, you know, they're trying to wade through, should they get a little filtering unit for their room or their office? And if so, all of the constellation of words, HEPA and MERV 13 and all that. Is there anything that cuts through that or just get a subscription yeah. to consumer? Let's demystify that because it's not, it's not that hard, but I, I understand for a lot of people, the first time they're, they're thinking about these things. So let, let's demystify it entirely. Um, let's start with HEPA. A lot of people have seen HEPA on a box, right? But these are high efficiency uh, particulate air cleaners. They can, and you maybe have seen 99.97% removal. And some people say, well, then it doesn't capture the small ones. But the reality is filters are rated on their worst performance particle size. So 0.3 microns for whatever, for, uh, for a lot of reasons, I can tell you why, is the hardest for filters to capture. At bigger particle size, it's near 100%. At smaller, it's near 100 so remember that if you see 99.97, that, that's nearly 100% for the, the it, particle sizes we're interested in here. Uh, these can work. And actually, we have that tool on our school's website. If you want to say, well, it would work in my bedroom or office, you measure the size of your space, height of the ceilings. We, we have a five-step thing. How do you select what we call the clean air delivery rate for your, for your HEPA filter? It's really straightforward. But anyway, that's HEPA filtration. If you're in a building and you have uh, mechanical systems up in the, the ceiling, let's say, you still want to use better filters to capture the circulated air. And the rating system is not HEPA-based. It's called MERV, M-E-R-V. Typical building has a MERV-8 filter. Captures a small percent of airborne particles, not designed for infection control. You want to upgrade to a MERV-13 or better, and that'll capture a greater percent. So really simple, MERV-13 in your mechanical system, say in your office or your central air. And if you think about a portable air cleaner for your school or home or even your dorm room, uh, you, you have to be HEPA based and avoid the gimmicky stuff. You know, you don't need a air cleaner. If you see something with like plasma or ion generation or UV, you know, you don't need it. Just the HEPA filter works really well. Got it. Um, uh, Margaret, anything we're missing from your point of view? No, no, I would definitely defer all questions to that effect. Uh, I'm learning. All right. Too, so well, let me good. just plow right ahead then um, on filtration. One thing is to have some central way of treating the air in the room. The other, of course, is to stick a filter over your mouth, which I guess is a mask, although not typically the way we're thinking about, you know, the build your own masks, which are about preventing your output more than it is filtering your input. How close are we? How possible is it to have sufficiently good masks? I don't know if we're talking N95, P100, or those are the MERVs of masks. Right. Um, that could make it so that you could wander into that stale room that has a miasma of virus in it and feel relatively secure. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not saying we should uh, go into those spaces. Look, if they're underventilated, you should leave, right? But the, the ma masks are doing a really fine job here. And, and you might be surprised that even um, these kind of homemade masks we're using and, and even gators, despite that headline that came out, uh, can actually be effective. And here's why, right? Normally. If you're in a healthcare setting or let's say a worker in an industrial setting, wearing an N95, you're, you're protecting yourself, right? There's no other control on the other side. But take two people wearing masks in a room at 50% efficiency, not anywhere close to N95, right? But the particles that come out of my mouth, 50% removed through my mask, and then another 50% through your mask. That's 75% reduction. That's pretty good for a mask that doesn't work that well and everyone can get a hold of anywhere and put on their face, right? Uh, some of these masks get 60 or 70 percent. The combined effect of two masks then starts to push 85 percent or greater. You can get up to 90 percent. So this is the universal, this is the importance of universal masking, right? You know, if you're going to go into a, a really high risk environment, no one's wearing masks, people are sick, well you better have something like an N95 on, like the doctor would wear. But once everybody has these uh, source control masks on, um, it's, it drives down risk. And I'll tell you, all the risk calculators, including the one my team is building from the, the cruise ship that are out there now, even some that are based in Excel, based on old equations that we use to estimate risk, you can drive down risk through engineering controls pretty good. The only way to really drive it down is universal mask wearing indoors, really. It, once you add the mask to the equation, that's when risk really drops. Before that, you're around the margins, you know? You're, you're doing a good job, 50% reduction, 60% reduction, great. You hit, you hit it, uh, everyone wearing a mask, you can drive it to 99% reduction. At which point do you have the exponential curves in your favor? You actually, if you could do that long enough, you just could kill it, right? Because it 
then exhausts itself among the people where it lives. Yeah, so you have the, the engineering controls are happening. And also, you know, we haven't really talked about this, but dose matters, right? This is going back to Paracelsus. Dose makes the poison here. And it looks like that evidence is starting to show too that, you know, it's, it's that first inoculum, that first hit you get. Well, mm. if the mask is limited and you get one viral particle or some really small amount, that's going to be a lot better for you, one, in terms of the likelihood of infection, two, maybe the depth of the infection. Uh, so it's about dose control too. And, and this is all, um, all of that's playing a really important role. Yeah. Got it. Uh, back to testing. So for Margaret, uh, is anybody doing it right in America? Is there any jurisdiction you can point to where it's like, all right, at least within their La Florian, they're doing it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, lots of states have, have um, you know, transferred over to, well, so first of all, testing for which purpose? I mean, there's kind of mm. just a quick and dirty way to describe it. There's kind of three venues where testing is happening and it's kind of, well, it's a little correlated to why you test. So testing is happening in hospitals uh, when patients show up who are sick. Um, and a lot of hospitals have their own, you know, internal labs that can do testing. And they're turning those around, you know, quite readily. And in general, you know, I think hospitals by and large are doing a pretty good job of uh, controlling the infection and taking care of patients when they come. Uh, the other place that uh, testing is happening is in the, is to the purpose of, of driving down community transmission. And that's where we struggled. So that's where primary health care centers and community health centers have, um, you know, have, are, are taking patients who've told they've been exposed, they need a test, uh, or who have mild symptoms and want to get tested. And that was really tricky because all the, a lot of those folks' uh, places, uh, primary care centers were locked into Quest and LabCorp. Uh, but many have found alternatives um, to that and are now turning around testing uh, more quickly. Um, uh, and then the third place is with the state pop-up kind of ad hoc testing centers, uh, you know, uh, and these might be in the parking lots of CVSs or there might be a program where they go through and test everyone in a nursing home. And states were also sending those tests to Quest and LabCorp uh, as well and we're getting, um, you know, we're, we're having significant delays. So a lot of states are, you know, trying to figure out alternatives and some are, are successful in doing so. So there, there's definitely so, some progress in, the, in that regard to some degree. I mean, we're still having short, you know, as um, Dr. Allen mentioned, you know, we, we are really reliant on one type of test uh, that has to kind of be done a certain way. And, and, you know, we're having some shortages with the reagents you need to run those tests and it's a complication. Um, but uh, yeah, but by and large, there are, their testing is happening and, and, and is starting to turn around uh, in, so, in some places. So, so that's awesome. And uh, just to say, you know, we're all really hoping that uh, not only will we get some more efficiencies um, out of that uh, approach to testing uh, in the very short term, uh, but we're also hoping that, uh, you know, that we're going to have uh, other ways of testing um, and other approaches to testing that hopefully can be harnessed and uh, governed and allocated in, in, in ways that really uh, give us much, much better control. So it's not all bad news. All right. And last question, any best practices similarly uh, in school reopenings, whether school districts, K through 12, or universities? Any good models to point to or possibly models that are models of what not to do? Well, I think I'd point to the models of what not to do first. I think those are easy to find. Um, even if you look at the outbreak in Israeli schools, right, people are saying, well, you know, look what happened to Israel, Israeli schools. But uh, the reality is this report came out just two weeks ago, too. Um, the, what happened was they hit, had a heat wave and they, they closed the windows, turned on the air conditioning, only recirculated air, and they took masks, they took their masks off during this. So uh, it really wasn't surprising then again. And, and same thing with the Georgia schools, the Georgia camps, same thing. Re read the CDC report there, but they had 15 kids in these camps. So, so uh, you know, in, in, the, in these cabins, uh, they say no ventilation, windows closed, doors closed. They allowed singing in the cabin uh, and no masks. And then people would say, well, it's shocking, you know, that the kids got sick here. It's like, well, you know, it's kind of obvious, especially when community spread is really high. So a lot of lessons to be learned on, um, on what's been gone wrong. The harder thing is what's gone right, because there are a lot of those stories, but they're hidden, right? They're not headlined where even in our town, right, there's, uh, uh, you know, daycares have been open uh, and no cases through and camps through the summer. 
Uh, YMCA's in New York City stayed open in March, in New York City during the peak. Very few, if any, cases, very, very low, um, you know, they, they were managed to control risk. So a lot of these learnings from what's gone right are harder to find, really. And I think, you know, this is something we really need to improve as a country that my fear is we're going to get to December, we'll have, you know, sporadic outbreaks in some schools versus others, some schools will be just fine. And since we're not systematically collecting the data, we're just not going to know why. So like we'll be in the same boat we are right now trying to guess, well, what strategy works? But imagine we systematically collected that and tracked it. We'd be able to say, hey, you know what's working and not working? When a school doesn't mass and doesn't have this in place, this is when we're seeing the outbreaks. And we'd learn and that, from the that lack of data collection is a leadership thing or it's a, a, just nobody's gotten around to being able to, there's no time to, uh, to navigate. We're just trying to aviate here. I mean, it, it can, this is all doable. I'd say, you know, it, it'll, it'll come down to enterprising scientists. Somewhere it's gonna, someone somewhere is gonna create the database, right? This is how it's been going, this total ad hoc thing. It should be centralized. Um, you know, how do we manage this thing without, you've seen the data collection problems we've had uh, through our society, through the first couple months of this. But it really concerns me with schools in particular because there's so much to learn. And, and even the, the um, what we've learned about what's gone wrong or right are totally anecdote. I know two stories from my town. We have that from YMCA. We know the Georgia schools. We, we know like a hand, you know, I'm, that's like five things. But there's so much more we could know, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's deeply frustrating. And, and, and my concern is that we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna do the same thing for the next couple of months and not, never really know what worked or didn't until way after the fact. Well, despite the, um... Uh, just how troubled the times are and uh, how dodgy a place we're in. I come away from this conversation uh, feeling a little more comfortable that uh, we've got really smart, talented people on the case here and uh, really thinking about the public interest and how we might be able, uh, whether it's through mutual aid or otherwise, um, to fill in the large gaps that exist in leadership and uh, in coordination in trying to take on this problem. Um, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. Margaret, you're a total hero for coming in from a national park <laughs> to do this and uh, great show reception. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joe, for being on the call. It's fascinating and we just really appreciate your leaning in and, uh, and, and really, uh, showing up here at this moment of need. Um, and Jonathan, thank you also to you for facilitating such a such an awesome conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Oh, I would say okay. thanks. Too. I, I enjoyed it. All that right. was really interesting. Learned a lot too. So uh, pleasure to be on with you both. Thank you so much. Very good. We'll catch you in a future week and thank you as well to our participants. Till soon. Yeah. Bye, Take care. Bye bye.